Praise God. It's another beautiful day that the Lord has made. And uh, it's another blessing for all of us to be here. Thank you, praise and worship, for those beautiful songs. Thank you, everyone, for giving some time to come here and enjoy the, the Word of God. The Word of God that gives us hope, encouragement, something to look forward into. And uh, our, uh, our topic for today is found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1 to 11. If you have your Bible with you, you can turn your Bible to Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1 to 11. I'll be reading from 1 to 3, then we will continue on later on. This is what the Lord says. Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let us pray. Father God, again, O oh Lord, you have blessed us to be here again. Thank you, O oh Lord God, for the life that we have, all the blessings, protection, and guidance, the love that you have shown us, the patience, the mercy, the grace of God that we enjoy. We thank you, O oh Lord God, once more as we gather as a family, O oh Lord God, in praising you. Thanking Him for everything, O Lord God. Truly, O Lord, you deserve all the glory and honor and praises. And as we study your word today, O God, we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us. Pray for your wisdom and understanding. We also pray for those who are still coming, O God, that you will bring them safe in this place. And we also enjoy your word. And again, O Lord God, I pray that these words that we will hear today, O God, will remind us of your words that we may live by them that we may continue to honor you with the life that you have given us in this we pray with thanksgiving in Jesus name Amen and Amen so our uh, month of February is we all know it's a love month right? love month and our topic for today is also about love. It's a different kind of love. And I entitled it Tough Love. Right? Tough Love. Right? When you speak about tough love, normally it's associated with the father. Normally. Right? Normally associated, I say tough love. In, in our family, tough love is normally coming from the father. Right, and uh, the mother, on the other hand, has a you know they call them loving mothers, which is you know they love their children with affection. They are uncritical. They are adoring. They are fond of their kids, right? So they like almost suffocate them with love, right? So normally the mothers are like that, right? Loving mother. But when it comes to the father, normally the father is quiet. Right? And when the mother could not handle it, then normally the father is the one that, you know, step in, right? So our topic for today is all about tough love. And sometimes, you know, we don't want to, you know, experience this tough love. Tough love is actually discipline, right? Discipline. It's hard to be disciplined. Okay. 
that the uh, tip. So what is the purpose of tip? What is the purpose of tough love? Tough love is to discipline us and to educate us, right? Here in Hebrews, which normally people believe it's written by Paul, he says there that the father's discipline we should not, you know, take lightly, right? Nor faint when you are punished by him, for whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he punishes every son whom he accepts. Right? What kind of father are you if you know your kids are misbehaving and you just let them let them do what they want to do, right? Mean to say you don't love them, right? And uh, back home they always say, Oh, that, that child is a spoiled child, right? And sometimes some people take it as, you know, spoiled child, but the word itself is already bad, right? It's spoiled. What's been spoiled? Rotten. Right? It means rotten. But we say, oh, it's a spoiled child. It means to say, he's a rotten child. Right? Unruly. No discipline. Right? But some people, they think that it's okay. Yeah, it's a spoiled child. It's spoiled child. Right? But that's not good. Right? So let's start from the beginning. And in the first verse of 12, it says there, therefore. Right? Therefore. Meaning to say, there's something ahead of verse 12, or chapter 12, which is chapter 11. And if you turn your Bible in chapter 11, you would see the Hall of Famers, the Faith Hall of Famers, all those people. So it talks about faith, what is faith? Is something, or that is, you know, hope of something that we are anticipating, you know? We have faith. The certainty of things that we hope for, right? Meaning to say, this is guarantee, you know, the thing that the Lord has promised us. We are looking forward into this day that the Lord will accomplish His plan in our lives. And it says there, therefore, we are surrounded, we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. He was saying, look, look at all these people, all these people mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. It's not just one person, but a lot of them, from Abraham to all those people, to David, Solomon. You could see all these people who are anticipating for the promise of God. We are surrounded by all these people. Imagine, these people didn't know who is the coming promise. They are looking into the future. They have no idea who he is, right? But we, on the other hand, know we are looking backward, right? We all know that it was Jesus himself. So he was saying here that we also have such great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, so let's give get rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sins which so easily inside us. We have these witnesses, we have these people who live a life that we will look at it, it's a hard life, right? If you just turn your Bible in Hebrew 11, you will see what happened to these people. It says there, all this died in faith without receiving the promise, but having seen them and having welcomed them from the distance, having confessed that they were strangers and exiled on earth. What happened to them? Some of them were tortured, some of them were imprisoned, scourged, in chains, stoned, sown to two, tempted, put to death by the sword. All these things happened to them. Meaning to say, it's not only them, also us, right? If we live by faith, we may also encounter difficulties, right? 
unlike other people that preach nowadays in some Christian circles, so-called Christian circles. And all they preach is, you know, you will be happy, you will be healthy, and you will be wealthy. Healthy, wealthy, and happy. Right? But that's completely opposite on what Scripture say. The Scripture say, if you live a godly life, a righteous life, what happened to you? You will be persecuted. You will be hated. You know? Because you stand against the norm. You stand against what is happening in this world. Right? Now, if you stand for what is right, people will say, oh, you're this and that. You hear all these bad things. And it's nothing different from the early believers. The same thing with us. But we have a great cloud of witnesses. Something that the Lord has given us so that we would not lose hope. Right? So that we would not doubt. Right? All these people mentioned here. Now, after saying all these people, because we have this hope, we have these witnesses surrounding us. He said, let us get rid of ourselves, every obstacle, and the sin which easily entangles us. You know, we're living in this world. We are always exposed to sin, temptations, trials. Just open your computer, right? You will see a lot of things popping up, right? And sometimes you get enticed. You want to go there, right? Then just watching it. Then you know, before you knew it, you're hooked, right? Not only that, at workplace, you know, you're tempted with things that are not yours, right? The way you speak with other people, you know? When people gossip and you also join in the gossip, right? Temptations, right? Money, faith, pride, right? Something that we should be watching, right? Something that we should be aware of. Because it says here that sin, we are caught by it so easily. We are easily entangled with it. When we are entangled, what happened to us is that we are... Uh, slow down, right? Our walk in our faith, uh, the momentum that we have, right? We, we kind of slow down, right? Or sometimes even completely stop, right? Sin is all around us, right? And the scripture says here that we should get rid of ourselves every second every hindrance, everything that we think that would slow us down, right? I was watching one uh, YouTube video and there's one Christian lady who used to be with the worldly and then she became a Christian and then when she became a Christian said, I want to go back, I want to share the word with my friends, right? But well, she's not that strong yet. She's a, she's a young Christian. So what happened is, when she went home, met her friends, you know, before you knew it, she's back. She's back in that kind of lifestyle, right? So we should be aware. Every people has his or her own weaknesses. You should be aware of that. If you think that you are weak with regards to money, don't take the position of a treasurer, right? Please, if you are tempted with money, don't take the position of a treasurer, right? And if you are, you know, weak with women, never visit those sites that are, you know, what I'm talking about. Never go to those places. Because if you know you're weak in there, don't even entertain it. Don't even go there. Don't even approach there. Those areas. 
right? Because once you are entangled, it's so difficult to untangle, right? I don't know if you experience like walking in a you know in a woody area where there are a lot of uh, you know those thorns. When you get caught, it's not easy to get out. The more struggle you do, the more you get caught with those uh, thorns, right? And some animals, when they get caught into those kind of uh, bushes, they die there. They, 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 could not, they could not get out of there. They need help from the outside, right? So when you have brothers and sisters, you notice your brothers and sisters are struggling, please help them, pray for them, right? Because sometimes by themselves, they could not get out of it. That's why we are here, you know, to encourage one another, to help one another. Let us all get rid of this obstacle and the sin which easily entangles us. Now, once you get entangled, or get snared, or get trapped, doesn't mean you give up. Don't give up, right? Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here is an analogy of Paul, or the writer of this uh, book. He uh, compared it to a race, right? Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The thing is, this race is not a 100 meter dash. It's more like a marathon. What's the difference between a 100 meter dash and a marathon? The 100 meter dash is who's the fastest? Who's the one that's gonna reach the finish line first, right? Our race is more of a marathon. It's endurance. It's a very long distance, right? So it's not the fastest. You can be the fastest, but you don't reach the end, then you lose. For us, it's more of a marathon. It is a matter of endurance, right? It's a race that is set before us, and there is a finish line. And it says there, let us not lose hope. Let us persevere. Well, perseverance is only associated with obstacle, right? You don't persevere when everything is easy, right? For us Christians, it's not easy. It's never easy, right? Even the Lord Jesus Christ said, enter the narrow gate. Squeeze yourself in that narrow space. It's not easy. It's difficult, right? That's why we have to run with endurance, with strength. But the thing is, the strength that we have is not our own strength. The strength that we have is coming from God Himself, right? Next one. There you go. That's the end line of the race. It's Jesus Himself. It says there, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter, of our faith. He was an example who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So something that the Lord has given us, an example, he himself endured the cross. The same day, the same way with us, Jesus said, unless you are ready to carry your own cross, you're not worthy. You have to carry your own cross. And in the Philippines, during the Lent, you know, it's coming, people, you know, literally carry a wooden cross. You would see that, especially in Pampanga, right? Certain place in the Philippines where people are actually, literally, get nailed on the cross. I have one friend, he told me, oh, it's so painful, got nailed on the cross. But what does Jesus say when he said, carry your own cross? 
some people would say, no, I, uh, my husband is my cross. <coughs> or the husband said, my wife is my cross. Or my children are my cross, right? They're a burden, they're, they're the one I have to bear, right? But actually it's not like that. You see, in the time of Jesus, when you carry a cross, right? There's only one meaning. You're going to be nailed into that cross. When you carry a cross, it's already a sign of death. It's a pen of death penalty already. So when Jesus is saying that to carry a cross, He was actually saying, you have to be ready to die. You have to be ready to give up everything for His namesake. For God. <coughs> now looking unto only at Jesus, meaning to say, focus on Jesus. Remember the story of Peter in the Sea of Galilee, right? And Peter saw Jesus. Then is that you, Lord? Yes, it's me. And then permit me to to walk, right? And the Lord said, "Okay, come." He was able to walk on water until he removed his sight on Jesus and start looking at the waves. Right? He's a fisherman, he knew. Right? People don't stand on top of the water. Right? But his focus was for a moment being distracted by the circumstances that is around him. And the same thing happens to us. Same thing happens to us, right? We are easily distracted by the things that are around us. It can be a financial matter, you know, when you lose your job. My wife just lost her job. And I thank God that she lost her job. <laughs> I have fresh food every day. <laughs> All she does is cook. Right? We are distracted with many things. You know, when you lose your job, you're worried about, I'm right, just talking about one sister, okay, you have no job. <laughs> what are we going to do now? Right? Or sometimes you get illness, you get sick, you get diagnosed with this and that. You have problem with your children, you know? When your children start to lose interest in church activities, it's so sad, hard, right? There are many things around us that we get distracted. And we take our focus on the one who could fix the problem. Rather than focusing on the circumstances that we are in. Normally that's what we do, right? We see a problem, we try to fix it, we try to fix it, and then we get anxiety, we get worries, and in the end nothing is fixed because we try to fix it ourselves. And during that time, we have taken out our sight on Jesus. That's the main thing. That's how the devil works. You know, he gives you so much problem that you see all the problems and you don't see the one who could fix the problem. Sometimes you have to make a choice. What am I going to choose? Am I going to compromise? Or am I going to stand on my ground? Are you going to do what is expedient? Or are you going to do what is right? It is something that we have to, a choice that we have to make. But here, in the book of Hebrew, the writer says, looking only at Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. You want to finish the race? You have to fix your eyes on Jesus. 
right? If you just keep on looking around, you know when a person runs, he doesn't look on his right, doesn't look on his left, all he looks is the finish line. Because when you look around you, it slows you down. And that's what the devil wants. He wants to slow you down. Not only slow you down, but completely stop you. He doesn't want you to reach the finish line. Well, Jesus is the originator and the perfecter of our faith. Meaning to say, the things that the Lord has started in your life, He will finish it. He will finish it. Later on, we'll find out how are we going to finish, right? How are we going to endure? So, the Lord or the writer even give Jesus as an example who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down on the right hand of God. Meaning to say the Lord endured all these things. And now where he is, he's sitting on the right hand of God. Right? Or consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself. Consider him. Jesus as an example, right? Endure such opposition from sinners so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. We should not lose heart. We should not lose hope. I know we have loved ones that we are praying for. Maybe parents, maybe brother, sister. Maybe daughters, sons, right? Cousins, grandmas. You know, sometimes, you know, we pray and it seems to be that nothing is happening. Nothing is happening, Lord. I want my parents, I want my brothers and sisters, I want my daughters and sons to come into faith. But sometimes you don't see any, any signs that they're changing at all, right? Sometimes I even pray to the Lord, Lord, I know this request is legitimate. I'm not asking for myself. I'm not asking for money. I'm not asking for anything else. I'm just asking for my loved ones. And sometimes you don't see anything. But we should not lose hope. As I was saying, even Tyndale, when he was praying, when he was about to be burned at the stake, he was saying that somehow that the Lord would touch the heart of the king. That he would someday see what Tyndale is trying to do. Because it, he translated the Bible into English and a lot of these people, you know, they, they don't like it. So he was burned at the stake and he died. But eventually, eventually, actually the king ordered the, pro the production of the Bible. He didn't see it. He didn't see it during his lifetime. The same thing with us. Just because we don't see anything happening, but we stop praying. And I'm just praying sometimes, Lord, I want to see it before I, before I, you know, I pass away. I want to see my loved ones come to faith before I die. But there's no guarantee that you would see it. It doesn't mean that you give up. It doesn't mean that you lose heart. You never know. It will happen after you pass away. And the only moment you find out is when you go there. And one day, you will see your loved ones in there. Right? That's why the Lord encouraged us. Endure. It's not easy. Right? Do not lose heart. Now, Now we go to the tough love.
the writer of the Hebrews says, You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And have you forgotten the exhortation which addressed you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are punished by Him. For whom the, lo the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He punishes every son whom He accepts. Right? Now, if you read the Scriptures, if you read the letters of Paul, right? And I was looking into it. Corinthians, Ephesians, Galatians, Thessalonians, Colossians, even writings to Timothy. You will see these words. We all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath just as the others. These are Christians, right? But it says there, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Colossians 3, 5, 8. Put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, idolatry. That's to mean filthy language. Filthy language. I don't know if you experience it, but in my workplace, I hear, I hear a lot of filthy language. Right? Everything that they talk about is some kind of sexual connotation. And it's normal for them. Right? You just say something and suddenly, you know, it's something else. Right? Filthy language. Wrath, anger, malice, you know, when, you, when people find out that you got an increase and they don't get an increase, you know, they, they get envious. Are we like that? Envious just before people get increased and you don't get increased? If that people didn't get increased, are you going to get increased? No, you're not going to get increased. Let's say he has one dollar more, more than you. If he doesn't get the one dollar, do you get the one dollar? No. Right? Both of you don't have one dollar. Even if he doesn't get, even if he doesn't get the one dollar, he don't get the one dollar. Right? Envious. Malice. Blasphemy. You know, backbiters. Immorality, right? First Corinthians. Do not keep company of sexually immoral people. Do not keep company with anyone named a brother or a sister who is sexually immoral, covetous, idolater, reviler, drunkard, extortioner. Not even to eat with such a person. Very harsh. Put away from yourselves the evil person. These are the writings of Paul. You know, when we become Christians, when we accepted the Lord as our Savior, you know, when we come into faith, it doesn't matter your past. Your past is past. Right? I've taken away your sin and I have, you know, put it as far as the east from the west. How far is the east from the west? Doesn't mean. East and west doesn't mean. Now, when you become a Christian, it's another story. Right? You could not live the same way as you lived before. Right? It's very strict. That's why Paul even mentioned that, you know, you should not be with these people at all. And you're even proud, you know, the Corinthian church. Imagine, you know, when, when the news reached Paul, he said, can you not even judge that what you're doing is 
It's something that is really bad that even the unbelievers don't do it. Because it so happened that there's a brother in there, seems to be a brother, that is sleeping with his father's wife. Meaning to say this is his father's uh, second wife, most likely. Not his original, not his mother, but his father's second wife. Right? And he said, it shouldn't be even mentioned. It's, it's very bad. And then Paul said, you know, get, you know, cast him out. Put him away. That's how strict it is. Right? Why is the Lord so strict with regards to these things? I remember the psalm that we read a while ago. The psalm that we read a while ago. Psalm 23. The Lord has, you know, guide me in a path of righteousness for His name's sake. For His name's sake. When you become a Christian, you are carrying the name of God. And when you do bad things, and you're carrying the name of God, the name of God is blasphemed. Yeah, and then some people say, he's a Christian? He claimed to be a Christian? Why is he like that? No? And some people, you know, you, you be, instead of becoming a stepping stone, you become a stumbling block. That's why Paul says, you know, you have to remove all this living from among yourselves. It's very strict in the early church. Nowadays, if you discipline a person in the church, they should say, okay, fine, I'm going to go to another church. Right? I'm going to move over there. Now someone will be disciplined. Oh, I'm going to make my own church. Right? In the early church, it's not like that. Because they are exclusive, they are small. Right? They are identified. And other people are even scared to join them. Especially when they found out that two believers in the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira, just dropped dead. You see, in this church, if somebody just dropped dead because they were disciplined by God, do you think we could invite more people to me? Right? No, they wouldn't even come close to this place. Unless, unless you really have the heart for God. We don't want this church, you know, getting the wrong people. What I mean the wrong people. We don't want the people that are coming here, they just want to be healthy, wealthy, and happy. We don't want those people who just, they just want to be saved. Without repentance. Yeah. There is no change of lifestyle. I just want to be saved at the same time, live my life the way I wanted it. That is not Christianity. Christianity, once you give your life to Christ, like Paul said, it is no longer I who lives. It is Christ who lives in me. Right? Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not speak the word of the Lord thy God in vain. But if you look closer to the word speak there, it means carry. Carry. Meaning to say, we carry the name of God in everything we do. We represent the God of creation. And when we do something off, people blaspheme God. This is, the, this, is how you, this is how you are. You say you're Christian, you're living like the rest of the world. Right? There's no distinguishing mark. But that is why the writers of people says here, 
For God loves you, that's why He disciplines you. Right? In the early church, you know, when, it called, when, when, when I'm talking about discipline, discipline can also be death. You know, some people, they die. They die. In the Corinthian church, remember? 1 Corinthians 11, we always, you know, we always quote that verse when we do communion. What did Paul say there? Some people who just, you know, they, they did not honor the, the bread and the wine. They partake of the bread and the wine without honoring God. What happened to them? Some of them are sick. Others are sleep. Sleep means they're dead. Right? That's how it is. Somehow in our generation, we have lost the reverence for God. In Hebrew chapter 12, when you go home, try to read after this topic that we are discussing here. And the writers of Hebrew given the example of Moses. Moses, the great man of God was trembling and fearful in the sight of all the things that he saw in Mount Sinai. He was trembling and was fearful. That's how reverent he is. And nowadays, you know, there's no more reverence. No more respect for God. It's just, it's just sad, you know? We have lost that. Why? Because people got used to the notion that God is loving, God is caring. It's like, you know, with the moms, you know, they love their children, of course, that's understandable, you know, because the children came from them, you know. And uh, sometimes the father has to step, step in, right? To give us the tough love, the discipline that we are, we needed badly. Especially in the church. We have lost our way somehow. And, you know, we, we got somehow, our brain is somehow accustomed to the notion that God is love, God is loving, that is true. But, you know, when you don't preach that God is holy, God is righteous, God will never let any sin unpunished. There is always discipline associated with it. You know, when, when things get, 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 gets bad, you know, I always ask myself, what did I do? Did I do something wrong? I always assess myself when things get bad. Is this a correction from the Lord? Or is this a trial from the Lord? What is the purpose of this thing that I am experiencing right now? Is this to make me strong or is it to make me go down? If it is going down, then it's a temptation. It's a, if it's something that would make me strong, then that's a trial. The thing is in the Greek, the word temptation and the word trial, they are the same word. The only difference is the purpose of it. If the purpose is to make you stronger, in the faith, then it's a trial. But if the purpose is to pull you down from your faith, then that's a temptation. But for us, us believers, this is what the Lord says. He disciplined us for our own good. Verse 11. All discipline seems not to be pleasant, but painful. I don't know who does the disciplining in your family. In my family, it's my mom. I think my mom is enough. More than enough. My dad never laid his hands on us. But my mom, oh my dear. She's very, very strict. Right? It's also very, very painful because it's either a bamboo stick or it's a guava stick. I would prepare the bamboo stick. The guava stick is more painful. It is not pleasant when we are disciplined, yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, 
it yields the fiscal righteousness. Right? If we are not corrected by God, we won't walk this path. But the thing is, we should be glad because we have a relationship. If we are not being corrected, then you're out of the family. You are not sons and daughters of God. So when you experience correction from God, you should be glad because He is watching over you. Right? You have to look at it on the positive side. It is not pleasant, I know. When my mom, you know, scorches, you know, literally scorched, it's not pleasant because it's painful. No cursing at all. If you just say one word of cursing word, you're going to be done. But I grew up like that, so you never hear me do that. Even before I am, I, I became a person. I never curse. Because my mom doesn't like it. I was trained by it. And then I grew like that. And it became a part of it. You should not take it in a negative way, but you should rejoice because God is on your side. If you're facing the obstacle, trials, you know, you get entangled, there are brothers and sisters who could help you, pray for you. You know, if you're struggling with sin, struggling with pornography, struggling with money, struggling with many things, you know, the church is here to pray. Right? Don't worry. Don't be anxious. God is still in control. And the best thing of all, you know, it gives a peaceful fruit of righteousness. Without righteousness, without holiness, you will never see God. That's why God is still working in your life and in my life. Let's pray. Father God, again, we thank you, O Lord God, in reminding us that you have loved us. That's why you discipline us. It's not pleasant. It's painful. But it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Without it, O Lord God, we will never see you. I pray, O Lord, that you continue to grant us the strength your grace, O oh God, is sufficient for us to overcome all obstacles. I pray, O oh Lord God, that you would continue to encourage us with your word, continue to grow in the faith, continue to do whatever life grows on our path. Continue to focus our sight on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Play or pray, O oh God, that we continue to honor you with the life that you've given us. And I pray, O oh Lord God, that you would bring more souls into this place. People that would love you and honor you and thank you for everything that you have done. This we pray with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name. Amen.